Alabama. Be blessed. to um, share the word of the Lord on tonight. Um, the scripture says that man should not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. The primary job of the pastor is to teach. Um, in the book of Jeremiah, chapter number three, around the 15th verse, he said, I will give you pastors after mine own heart, which shall feed you with knowledge and understanding. So the primary responsibility of the pastor is to is to teach. And so we would like to at this time welcome um, you all to Bible class. And of course, those of you who are viewing from uh, by way of live stream, we want to welcome you all on tonight. So um, those my helpers, are we live tonight? All right. We are going to prepare our hearts to go into our lesson tonight. We certainly want to welcome those who are viewing um, from Madison um, with Elder Shaw, Sister Shaw. We want to welcome those um, who are viewing in uh, Jackson, Alabama, the, the P. Ride family, Monroeville, Alabama. Um, and Sister Gibbs, we say praise the Lord to you on tonight. Um, we would like to welcome um, tonight also uh, the Washington family in Bacon, Georgia. And um, I believe it's uh, Evangelist Jones in Stockbridge, Georgia. I'd like to welcome you. Um, also in uh, Mississippi, we'd like to um, welcome uh, Elder Scott and Sister Scott. Amen. Amen. So, I'd like to also take this opportunity to um, send a um, warm praise of the Lord out to those of you who are watching in Michigan, some of my family members who are watching in Michigan, um, aunts and uncles there. I'd like to extend a warm greeting also to my brother. Um, and his fiance there in Texas. Thank God for him. And um, another cousin there in Phoenix, Arizona. So we thank God for each of you. And if I have forgotten any, any, any of you all on tonight, uh, charge it to my head and not my heart. We certainly thank the Lord for uh, the Gulf Coast State Council and our diocese that is covered from Florida to Mississippi, Louisiana, and all the way up to Arkansas. So perhaps some of those who are part of our Gulf Coast State Council, maybe you are watching tonight, we would like to extend a warm welcome and praise the Lord to you also. So we're grateful for this opportunity. Um, I did not teach on last uh, Wednesday, but like to appreciate Elder Ja'Cory Creighton for doing a fine job on last Wednesday night in our Bible study. Our prayers go out to those who are sick and shut in on tonight. Um, we are moving from, from winter to spring. And of course, we are looking forward to enjoying the springtime weather with all of the things that come with the spring, we can't have leaves on the trees without pollen. And the yellow and green monster is out and many are being uh, affected by it in their sinuses and, and so on and so forth. But this is all a part of the transition from winter to spring. And we pray that um, you will have a great, great um, garden this year Amen, Sister Frazier has about 100 pots she has to paint and plant. 
So we pray that she doesn't wear herself out before Sunday. <laughs> but the Lord is good to us, and, and he's great and greatly to be praised. So on tonight, <clears throat> uh, we're going to continue our Bible class on the principles of the doctrine of Christ. And, of course, um, these six principles are found um, in the book of Hebrews, the sixth chapter beginning in verses number one through three. And it reads, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and of eternal judgment. And this will we do if God permit. Now, therefore, leaving the principles of the doctrine of Christ, let us go on unto what? Perfection. Now, many of God's children do not understand because many pastors and church leaders uh, do not understand the importance of teaching and instructing God's people so that they can grow spiritually. Um, the way you grow spiritually is basically the same way you grow naturally, if you use it in a metaphorical sense. Um, you have to have nutrition, food, water, in order to grow. And so the scripture says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. Amen? Now, I'm doing quite a bit of moving in, in this chair. Uh, Fred, if you could just move the camera up just a little bit, it'd make me feel a little bit more comfortable uh, because I am moving in my leg. Um, I'm gonna be moving around, stretching it out because I've been ripping and running all day. And, but it's good to sit down and teach, amen? So on, on, on tonight, the six principles uh, of the doctrine of Christ is repentance from dead works, faith toward God, the doctrine of baptisms, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. This is what we do if God permit. So these six principles are the milk of God's word that prepares one when they come into the knowledge of these principles to become teachers, mature enough to instruct and to teach others. And so in the fifth chapter of Hebrews, the preceding chapter to the sixth chapter, the apostle Paul said, for when the time ye ought to be teachers, you have need to one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God, and that because have become such as have need of milk and not of strong meat, because strong meat belongeth to those who are of full age or who have matured. Even by, even, even by use um, have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. Um, mature saints have the ability to discern what is right and wrong by way of the word of God. Um, just like in the natural, um, I remember um, when I was raised, I was, I, was, I was told what to stay away from. And one of those areas was to stay away from the stove. And I remember um, I wanted some cookies or something and the cookies were on the shelf above the stove. My mother had a hot pot, she was cooking. And I didn't wanna to wait till after the meal to have a cookie. I wanted to get one before the meal. So I climbed up on the stove. I had been doing it all along, but this time the stove was hot. You know, I had been sneaking cookies all along. I wasn't as fortunate to be as tall as Jonathan. So I had to climb. <laughs> and I remember climbing up on the stove and just one eye was hot. And as I was reaching for the cookies, um, I realized that I was burning myself. And boy, I burned myself pretty bad. 
And I hollered and jumped off that stove and ran to mama, showed her how bad I had burned myself. And she said, what in the world did you do? And I didn't want to tell her I got on the stove trying to get the cookies. And of course, I had to confess. I said, I was, I was on the stove getting the cookies. And she said, oh yeah, this time, that's why I told you to stay off that stove. And of course, um, she put something on it, on the wound there, and put a bandage over it. And I still got a whooping. See, that, that's how you would, that's how they, they, they made sure, you know. <laughs> but I was a child. And I, and I was, I was, I was very immature. Most cases, hard-headed, as they would say. And I had to learn some things. And, and I'm not the only one tonight. Some of y'all had to learn things the hard way, too. Huh? You just had to, you just had to learn it the hard way. And, and they said, I told you so, and still disciplined you. So a lot of what a, a, a baby saint or someone that first gets saved has to go through is a lot of instruction and a lot of uh, correction. And some, some survive it and some don't because we're in a time now where most people feel that cor correction is bad. But if you're gonna be saved, you have to be willing to be taught the word of God and you have to be willing to accept correction because in fact, the Lord, he corrects and chastens all of his children because he loves us, amen? You correct and you chasing your children because um, my, my father and mother used to say, it's better for us to get you than the police billy club. Daddy would say, the police billy club gonna hurt a whole lot worse than what I'm putting on you. So I'd rather put it on you to keep you from being a victim of a policeman's billy club. Now I remember, I shouldn't be telling all these stories. <laughs> My brother may be watching. So I don't wanna put him on the spot tonight, but I'm sure if he's watching, he's got some memories of his own. <laughs> Lord help us. He's brought, the Lord has brought us a mighty long way. Amen. Amen. All right, so tonight in the book of Acts, the 19th chapter. Acts chapter number 19 is where we want to start tonight. And since we're dealing with the doctrine of baptisms, I'm going to use Bishop Herman's, the late Bishop Harry L. Herman's words, under what were you baptized from the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. Now, last, third, last Saturday, I had a wonderful time in Madison, Alabama, up northern Alabama, across from Huntsville, Alabama. And Elder Shaw's gonna have to send me the number, uh, the exact number of the individuals that were baptized in Jesus' name on last Saturday. And my recollection, I think it was at least um, 15. It could have been more. Um, and the problem was more because Elder Shaw was baptizing, and I forgot the brother who was assisting in baptizing, but they baptized these candidates in the YMCA pool. And they were, and, I, and it, was, it was amazing to see those individuals coming so willingly of all ages, different colors, black and white, being water baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. What a wonderful, wonderful experience. So Elder Shaw is gonna to have to send the, the numbers, and Mrs. Shaw is gonna to have to send the exact numbers of those that were baptized. And I'm still looking for the pictures to be posted on Facebook. Um, so, um, on tonight in, 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 in the book of Acts, chapter number 19, beginning verse number one. And we will uh, begin there. 
and I will stop at uh, strategic points and, and we'll, move, we'll move on. But we're just gonna go with tonight, the first three verses of the 19th chapter of the book of Acts. All right, when you have it, can you say amen? amen. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus. Now, Ephesus today is Turkey. Um, our modern day Turkey is in the scriptures location of Ephesus. And now notice, and finding certain disciples, and he said unto them, have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, we have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, unto what then were ye baptized? And they said unto John's baptism. Now, um, which brings us to, I thought, unto what then were ye baptized? This is the question. Unto what then were ye baptized? Now, uh, most Christian religious beliefs profess a varying degree as it pertains to the necessity of water baptism. Now, of course, it's a vast varying degree because um, you can be baptized multiple ways, different ways, um, based upon that religion um, or that religion's beliefs. Um, and so um, that's not a, a um, something that is foreign to us. But Paul asks these individuals, unto what then were ye or you baptized? Everybody should know how they were baptized, if they've been baptized. Now, um, they're gonna give an answer, but think about it. How were you baptized? Um, some, to many, their baptism was a baptism to identify themselves with a certain church or religion. It's just to identify with a certain group, religious group or religion. Others uh, describe baptism as an, uh, an outward showing of an inward work. Um, so there's, there's various reasons why individuals are baptized. So um, some people, um, do it because that's what their mother did and father did. So they follow the, the same pattern of baptism of, of the family. This is how um, grandma did it. This is how granddaddy did it. This is how mama did it. This is how daddy did it. So this is why I did it with no kind of consciousness of God or a, a, a consciousness of what the Lord is requiring of them, but they just do it because that's what we do in our family. Um, some um, were baptized as children um, and, 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 or as babies. You know, there's such thing, some religion, uh, particularly I think it's uh, Catholic, that believe in the baptism of infants. Um, then you have um, some small children that are baptized, um, and then, then uh, some adults um, as entrance into a certain church or a certain faith. Various different ways and various different reasons why people are baptized. Now, um, we have to understand that doing our best um, sometimes it's not good enough. I did my best, so the Lord just has to, you know, sometimes our best isn't good enough. Um, um, if it was based upon our best, um, some of us never would have gotten out of high school. If it was just based upon us doing the best we can, uh, some of you would have never taken promotions 
on your job, will never finish your degree work, your undergrad work. You, you understand what I'm saying? In other words, what goes beyond doing your best is meeting what is required. And we understand in every area, other area of our lives that we have to meet requirements. But it seemed like when it comes to the Lord, well, I just do, I just do the best I can. Nine times out of 10, we know that our best isn't good enough. Now, I'm, I'm not talking about someone who has a limited, a limited knowledge of God, and they are walk, walking with the Lord based upon the amount of light that have shined on their path. And um, there are a lot of people who serve the Lord and are committed and devoted to God based upon the understanding or the light that has been shown upon their path. Well, why do you say light shown upon their path? Well, thy word, O God, is a light unto my pathway and a lamp unto my feet. So based upon what little understanding they have, they embrace their walk with God, not knowing that there is more required of them. Now, the only way for them to know is just like in the eighth chapter of the book of Acts, the, the open eunuch said, how can I except some man should guide me? So in order to understand the requirements of God as it pertains to salvation, you need someone to guide you. That, that, is, that, that, that is in the light. Because you know the scripture says, the blind lead the blind. And they all go to heaven together, right? They go into a ditch. Amen? Now, anybody ever crossed the main road like the Eastern Boulevard. That's a six lane road. You got three lanes going south. Wait a minute. Yeah, three lanes going south and three lanes going north. And are you going to let a blind person lead you across from one side of the Eastern Boulevard to the other? What if it's Ray Charles? He's a pretty good musician. He was a pretty good musician back in the day. Huh? Well, Ray Charles, we can't use him. He's gone. What about Stevie Wonder? Now, they, they claim, I don't want to get all into that, but it was kind of ironic that when um, one of the singers got on stage, looked over at Stevie and blew him a kiss, and he blew a kiss back. Now, I don't know how that worked, but I still can't trust him to walk me across the street. That's not enough evidence. <laughs> All right? So the blind need the blind. Y'all go in a ditch. So there are blind leaders that will convince you that they see clearly and that they're enlightened in truth, but they're blind. The blind lead the blind, and they all go in a ditch. Hmm? I could say something about that too. I'm going to keep it moving. Now, so when light comes, the gospel is called a glorious light. And when that glorious light shines, then you're supposed to walk in the light. 
as it is shining bright. And that's the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen? Now, so, um, evaluate how you were baptized. Let's just take a moment. Maybe some of you all are watching online. How were you baptized? Hmm? And if you can remember it, if you can evaluate it, keep it to yourself. Because at the end of the Bible class, I'm going to ask you again. And if you haven't been baptized, according to the scriptures, I want to give you an opportunity to be baptized according to the scriptures. Is that all right? All right. So now let's go back to Acts chapter 19, beginning verse number 3, 4 and 5. Let's read there. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism. Verse 4, Paul is giving them an answer now. Then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him which should come after him that is on Christ Jesus. Verse 5. When they heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, notice here. The apostle Paul asked them, under what then were you baptized? If it wasn't important, if baptism wasn't important, he never would have asked them. Part of the great commission in preaching the gospel, go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them. You understand? Mark 16 and 16, preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. Now he's not cursing there. He's saying damned there is their final ruin. So if it wasn't important, he never would have asked the question, unto what then were ye baptized? And they had to give in a, a response. They said, under John's baptism. We were baptized by John the Baptist. And the answer that Paul gives is an explanation of John's baptism. That John's baptism was the baptism unto repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, that's Jesus, who should come after him, which is Jesus, that is on Christ Jesus. So then, he explained to them that they, John was pointing individuals to believe on Jesus. That's the one that came after him. That's the one that he prepared the way for. He prepared the way for who? For Jesus. Now, verse number five. When they heard this, they were what? Baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Now, when they heard it, when they heard it, they believed on Jesus. This is why they were rebaptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, because they believed on him based upon what they heard. This is why in the book, of, of Romans, the 10th chapter, the 17th verse says, so then faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Now, how do you get that kind of faith? The Bible says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. How then shall they call on him in whom they not believe? How can they believe in him in whom they not heard? How can they hear without a preacher? How shall he preach except they be sent? For Isaiah says, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, bring glad tidings of good things. So the purpose and the responsibility of the preacher is to preach Jesus to the hearers 
to believe on him for a new car. I can, I can name a number of things where people are believing on Jesus for, and it has no relevance to their soul at all. To believe on him for the remission of sins, for salvation. He is the only answer for a lost and dying world. Jesus Christ is the way, the truth, and the life. There's no other way apart from him. And how do you know that? You have to hear the word preached from the preacher, the sent preacher. Not just any preacher, but the sent preacher. Amen? And the Lord has, the sent preacher is going to tell you what the Lord said and how the Lord wants you to do it based upon the Holy Scriptures, not based upon their idea not based upon their faults, but based upon the eternal word of God. Amen? Amen. All right. So now um, um, they said uh, they were baptized in the name of the Lord because of what they heard. Now, if you evaluated how you were baptized, if you have not been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus, because it's not all the same. It's not all the same. And I'm, I'm going to show you as we go on that it's not the same. In fact, um, it was several years ago, perhaps in the late 60s, early 70s, a census was taken. And we probably need to update that census. But a person could be baptized 27 different times. There were 27 different modes of baptism here in the United States alone. And 26 of those modes of baptism, the wrong baptisms. Amen. So it is, it is likely that if you have been baptized prior to hearing my voice, that you probably were not baptized based upon biblical baptism, which is administered in the name of Jesus Christ. Um, and if that's the case, then we're going to help you tonight. Amen? All right. Now, um, if you notice um, the next verse, verse number six, and when Paul had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Now, first of all, I'm going to, I'm going to do this in reverse order. Prophesied. Prophecy in the scriptures, there is an anonym. Anonyms are words that sound the same, pronounced the same, but spelled differently. And they have different meanings. In the scriptures, prophecy is spelled P-R-O-P-H-E-C-Y. That means to tell of a future event or something that is coming in the future to prophecy. Or prophesy. But then there is the word prophesy, P R O P H E S Y, which means to expound on the word of God or to preach or to expound the word. So they prophesied, they expounded on the word after they were filled with the Holy Ghost. They began to expound on the word of God. I remember, and I talked to him today. I talked to Brother Vincent Parker today. He called me today. And he was the second person, I think. No, the third person. Uh, maybe the fourth. That we baptized in Jesus' name when I started the church back in 1995. It was Sister Sullins. Little Jimmy, I think it was Sister Henrietta's daughter, little Jimmy, and Brother Vincent Parker. And I remember when we baptized Brother Vincent Parker that I, I said, Brother Parker, God wants to fill you with the Holy Ghost. We worked together at Russell's Corporation. I said, Lord, I want to fill you with the Holy Ghost. 
And so I had, we was in the old church. We had just a foyer in the sanctuary. And I had the, 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 the four or five members we had then to, to go into the foyer while I worked with him. And so I don't know why I did that, but I had them in the foyer while I worked, prayed for him, for him to receive the Holy Ghost. And so while I was praying for him, the Holy Ghost fell on him. He began to speak with other tongues. The Spirit of God gave the utterance. Afterward, he began to expound on the scriptures. He began to quote scriptures and expound on the word of God, just as these individuals did when they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, when Paul laid his hands on them, the Holy Ghost came on them, um, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. Everyone that receives the baptism of the Holy Ghost receives it just like they received it on the day of Pentecost. When it was first poured out on the day of Pentecost, Acts 2 and 4, they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. Well, I don't know about all that speaking in tongues and I don't, listen, if you want the Holy Ghost, you don't worry about the tongues. And if this real Jackson was in here tonight, he would tell you, when you bought your shoes, did you buy, did you go to buy the tongue or did you go to buy the, the shoes? You bought your shoes and the tongue is a part of the shoe. You want the Holy Ghost. You just want the Lord to fill you. And once he fills you, tongues is part of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen. So just like they received the Holy Ghost on their Pentecost, these disciples of John received the Holy Ghost. This is why the scripture says in St. John 3 and 5, Jesus said, Verily, verily, I said unto thee, except a man be born again of the water and of the Spirit. He cannot enter into the kingdom of God. The way you enter in is by way of water, that's baptism in his name, the name of the Lord Jesus, and by way of being filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, there's one Lord, one faith, and one baptism. The one baptism is the one operation of water and spirit. Amen? Now, um, now, 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 in order then to receive this experience and to be a disciple of the Lord, you have to continue in his words. See, everything as it pertains to salvation is based upon the word of God. So now let's look and, and see about his word. John 8 and 31. All right, John 8 and 31, um, and this is what truth does. Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my what? Word, then are ye my disciples in deed. So then in order to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ, you have to continue in his word. Now, you start by way of his word because you can't believe apart from his word. Remember what Jesus said in the seventh chapter of St. John? He that believeth on me, as the scriptures have said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living waters. Salvation is based upon you believing on him as the scriptures have said not based upon someone's opinion, not even based upon your, your, your imagination, not based upon um, or necessarily what you've been told or taught. If it doesn't line up with the scriptures, you can't receive the benefits that come with believing on Jesus as the scriptures have said. It's, and I wanna say this, if you are a believer, 
in Jesus Christ, but do not believe on him as the scriptures have said, then you are living beneath your privilege because to believe in Jesus is to believe on him as the scriptures have said. Amen? Now, 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 verse number 32. And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall what? And the truth shall make you free. So then, the way to be free is the truth. What is truth? His word is truth. Amen? Believing on him, as the scriptures have said, if you continue in my word, then are ye my disciples, how indeed. Now, you should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Now, believing on him, and according to the scriptures and his word. Um, let's go to Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 24, 25. Let me see if I can get there with you. Matthew chapter 7, and this is something that we need to take note of. All right, do you have it? Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 24 and 25. All right, let's read there. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and what? And doeth them, I will liken unto a, unto a wise man which built his house upon a rock. Verse 25, and the rain descended, and the flood came, and the winds blew, and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a what? A rock. Now, he's likening those that heareth his sayings and do them to a wise person. And he talks about the level of their wisdom is they build a house upon a sure foundation so that no matter what elements come against it, the house will stand. Whether it's a flood, whether it's rains, whether it's uh, tumultuous winds, the house fell not because it was founded upon a rock. Listen, brothers and sisters, when we hear his word and do with them, it makes us wise. I was sharing with a brother the other day, I looked at a documentary, and I, don't, I probably mentioned this in our previous Bible class, but it was interesting. In case you didn't know it, a, a, a Jewish child knows the law and understands the law that's found in the Pentateuch or the Torah. By the time it's 12 years old, better than we could ever try to learn it in a lifetime. Uh, they did a documentary on the Jews. And in this documentary, they were highlighting the IQ of many of the Jews. You know, Einstein was a Jew. Um, and, and there was um, a Jewish attorney that was, that was on, on the OJ team when OJ got in trouble. Um, and, and he's a noted attorney. I can't remember his name right now. But anyway, they discovered that by them learning the Torah and practicing it, that it had an effect on their level of IQ. So this is why, brothers and sisters, read the scriptures with your children. Teach them to your children. Amen. Now, 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 in Korea, they got, a, they got, they got knowledge of the, the high IQ of many of the Jews. So they hired a Jewish rabbi to come and to teach their children what is in the Torah. And the way one's, you know that one's IQ 
is, is raising is when they can answer a question with a question. Most individuals that have a high, high, high IQ knows how to answer a question with a question. But to make a, just to simplify it, is the word of God is so alive until in Psalms, I think it's 19 or 119, it makes wise the simple. Hallelujah. Glory to God. And so, and so, and so, um, he that heareth these things of mine and doeth them, many, many that have gotten, got saved, born again, got underneath being pastored. God did something for these individuals that they went from just meager positions to great and lofty positions in society. I've seen saints go from nothing to something, from a nobody to a somebody. Amen. And it's because of giving attention and attendance to the word of God. The reason why many of you are exercising the brilliance that you are exercising, don't give it all, don't give all the credit to genetics. Some of it is because of the word of God. Amen. It has raised your level of understanding. When you are a hearer and a doer of the word, it likens you as one that is wise. Now, on the other hand, on the contrary, verse 26, and everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a what? A foolish man. And what happens? Which built his house upon the sand. And the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and beat upon the house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. So then, it is wise. We are likened to be wise when we hear. See, it's more than just hearing. But when you hear and put into practice and live what you are hearing, it makes you wise, amen. But to hear it and don't do it, it makes you foolish, amen. Well, well, let's look in James chapter one. And I, and, I, and, I, and I hope, I would love for our young people to be here to hear this tonight because some of them hear and they don't, they don't hear, they hear but they don't hear. They hear what they want to hear. That's, what, that's the problem. Uh, James 1 and verse 22. All right, when you have it, notice what he says. Um, well, let's start in verse 21. I want to start in verse number 21. Wherefore, laying apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness, the engrafted word, which is able to save your soul. Now, you can't receive the word being naughty. You can't receive the word being bad, acting up, all right? Receiving the word calls for a certain kind of a heart. So in order to have that kind of heart, you got to put everything aside that's not of God. Wherefore, laying aside, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity and naughtiness, everything that is not of God, that is ungodly, that is, that, 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 y'all know what I'm trying to say, ain't it? You gotta lay that stuff apart. You gotta. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna be like this anymore. 
and with meekness receive, with, receive with meekness the engrafted word. Hallelujah. Receive with what kind of a heart? A meek heart. Jesus describes a meek heart like this, except ye become as little children. A little child is open for instruction. Amen? Meekness. I seen on, on um, Facebook um, an individual, a lady was getting baptized in Jesus' name. I think she was 96 years old. In meekness. It doesn't matter if you're a teenager or if you're 100 years old. Receive the word of God with meekness. Which is able to save your souls. Now, the things that he mentioned before, this naughtiness and superfluity and filthiness, all that pertains to is the flesh. which is temporary. You know, we have to give an account of the deeds done in our body. But these bodies that we, the deeds that we committed that were contrary to God are not even going to be judged. We won't even be judged with these bodies. These bodies, when we die, just go back to the dust of the earth. But we are living souls. And our souls and who we are as individuals, we are living souls. We will be judged by God based upon how we behaved in these bodies. And these bodies will not experience any of the judgment that will be brought upon our, our souls. That's so unfair to do all you can to satisfy something that's not able to be satisfied, only to lose your soul. That is so unfair, isn't it? When the Lord is giving you an opportunity for your soul to be right with him. What doth it profit a man to gain the whole world and lose his own soul? How do you lose your soul? By not receiving the engrafted word of God with meekness, which is able to save your souls. How then do we receive with meekness the engrafted word that is able to save our souls? Verse 22. But be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. It is a deceptive way of thinking that I can live any kind of way in my body and in the end, God will accept me as righteous. I'm, I will be deceiving myself. So many are deceiving themselves into thinking that just hearing the word is enough. Just going to church on Sunday and hearing the word and not doing it, just I heard the word and I'm gonna do what I wanna do. And the Lord is going to just say, all right, well done. And you haven't done anything. We're deceiving ourselves. I, now it's one thing for someone to deceive you and trick you. But it's another thing for you to deceive your own self by hearing the word and thinking that there's no responsibility to the word of God. Deceive your own selves. So we have to be careful, don't we? Um, now let's, let's look and see. The, um, well, um, let's look in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46. Luke chapter 6, verse number 46. All right. You have it. 
And I'm not going to be able to finish it all tonight, but I, but I, I wanted to get um, at least finish this part. All right, Luke 6, verse number 46. Do you have it? All right, okay. Let's read there. And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? How can we call him Lord? Lord, Lord, and don't do what he's saying. Make excuses for not doing what he is instructing us to do by way of his word. Is he Lord in your life? Yes, he is. Then do what he instructs you to do. Amen. Um, let's um, well, let's go to Acts chapter two, verse number thirty-eight. Since 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 we're right there, let's see what he is what he is what his instruction is. Let's start in verse number. Um, um, verse number thirty-six. All right, let's read there. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know surely that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. He's both Lord and Christ. So should we do what he said? Amen. Amen. All right. Now, when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart. Now, the pricking of the heart means that they felt a great deal of condemnation. Now, can you imagine their condemnation, the Jews here? Because these were the ones, just a few days ago, about 40 days ago, said, crucify Jesus. The ones that sped upon him, the ones that mocked him. You know, after all Jesus did, And, and, and fulfilling the scriptures, they would not receive him, nor would they believe. And here he is, their Messiah, their Lord. But here it is, 40 days later, he's risen now. And they're listening to the Peter preach after they witnessed the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. Peter give, has been given audience and he decides to preach Jesus and they're pricked to the heart. They're condemned. And they said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? All right. We're condemned. We were wrong. Now what, what can we do? We don't crucify him. But he, but he prophesied of his death. He said, destroy this temple and in three days, I'm gonna raise it up again. He had to go to the cross. For he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And thank God with his stripes we're healed. He was the lamb that was slain before the foundation of the world for the sins of mankind. So men and brethren, what shall we do? Notice, here's the answer. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Verse 39. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, what is he doing? He's answering their question. They ask the question, what shall we do? All right? They, they were hearers of the word, but weren't doers of the word. They knew the word. They knew the, the law. They knew the word, but they weren't doers of the word. So they're condemned. So what, 
What shall we do? So he's telling them what they have to do. They ask, they get an answer. Every one of you tonight that are asking the same question, this is the answer. The answer has not changed. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Now, you don't just haphazardly come to God. God has to call you. Amen. Those of you that's viewing by way of live stream, those of you in the home of the Charles and Madison, you're there because God is, has called you. Down in Monroeville, you're there because God has called you. In Jackson, uh, the P. Ryan family, God is calling. Georgia, the Washington family, God is calling. Wherever you are, Texas, Michigan, God is calling. can't come to him unless he calls you. Amen. I remember as a child, and I have so many stories as a child. My mother, had, she had quite a voice. And she could call us. And it didn't matter where we were. It seemed like we could hear her calling us. Anybody had mamas like that? Just down on the porch and just holler. <laughs> Didn't matter if the neighbors, whoever, just holler. Timmy! And it just carried. I said, Perry, was that mama calling? Yeah, 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 I heard it too. But we better get going. So we knew to run to the house when she called. Now in the house, She would holler. She just hollered anyway, call us. And sometimes we'd be busy doing some plan. You know, we had little action figures and army men and stuff. We'd be wrestling and clowning them. We used to have, we had fun as kids. One time she called. I said, "What?" I survived. I survived. It was a miracle. I never did that again. She get to hollering. Huh? I couldn't get it right for nothing. I hear my father running up them stairs, almost ready, to, just about killing himself to get to me. What is hard? Huh? <laughs> well, you told me not to say what. I got in trouble saying what. What is, Timmy, what is hard? Huh? That's how he used to do me. I said, I don't know what to say, Daddy. He said, say ma'am. And mama said, you, don't you dare call me ma'am. So I'm really confused now. I'm really confused. So I said, what do I do? Because I, I may not survive the next go round. So he said, whenever she calls, you say, I'm on the way. And you come to her. If I call you, say, I'm on my way, and you come. And don't be, don't be dragging. You come see what we want. That's what you do. But let us know you're on the way. Right? I think that's just be, be. She's a grown woman. She to, I'm on the way. <laughs> Amen. You understand? There's a certain response to God. When he calls. Amen. Um, how should we escape if we neglect so great a salvation, which at the first was spoken of by the Lord, was confirmed on us by them that heard it? 
He said, the day that you hear my voice, harden not your heart. What is his voice? It's his word. You can't, you, you and I, we can't tell the Lord, no, I ain't coming. What? Ah. When he calls us, he's calling us to him. As many as the Lord our God. Aren't you glad he called you? Out of all of the millions and billions of people in the world, he called you. Isn't that wonderful? Now notice here, their response. Now notice, all right? Um, let's finish up. Um, um, notice verse number 40. And with many other words did he, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. And, God, and if the generation was not toward God then, back then, it certainly is not toward God now. But well, how do you save yourself from a generation that's not toward God? How do you save yourself from a generation that's going totally opposite of God? Verse number 41. Then they that gladly received his word. Now, and James said, with meekness. Peter, he says, then they that gladly. Luke, here says, then they that gladly received his word. What did they do? Were baptized, and the same day they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. They gladly received the word. They gladly received the word, or they gladly believed on Jesus. They received the word with meekness because they repented. They turned away from everything that wasn't like God. And they gladly received the word. Don't get mad at God because he's calling you. That's the time to say, Lord, I praise you. Lord, I thank you. Because you didn't have to deal with me the way that you have dealt with me. You know, it's something about hearing the word and doing the word. Then they that gladly received the word, they heard it and were baptized, they did it. And 3,000 were added to the church. And notice what they did. They just didn't get baptized. And they continued steadfastly because it's not the hearers of the word that are just before, it's the hearers and the doers. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers, they continue. See, when the Lord calls you, he's calling you out of something. And sometimes it could be, um, well, he's calling you out of sin. He's calling you out of shame. He's calling you out of, out of a place of condemnation. But also he could be calling you out of your former religion whether it's Catholicism, whether it's Islam, whether it's Hinduism, or whether it's the Church of Satan, God will call you out for you to come out. Amen? And so um, it's the doers of the word. He that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them are my disciples indeed. He should know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. My time is up tonight. I'm going to have to pick it up again next Wednesday. But I hope something was said to encourage you on tonight. And, and, and you know, these principles uh, of the doctrine of Christ is, a, is, is an excellent um, um, time to be teaching at the beginning of the year. And, um, and I was wondering. Um, you know, it had been my custom for many years. Um, I've been pastoring this church now for uh, 29 years. And 
Yes, the Lord has been good to us. The Lord has been good to us. And I, I adopted this um, from my home church, my former pastor, Bishop Ira Combs, there in Jackson, Michigan. In fact, that's why the church here is named Greater Bible Way Temple. It's just Greater Bible Way Temple of Montgomery, Alabama. It was named after my home assembly there in Jackson, Greater Bible Way Temple of Jackson, Michigan. I did that in honor of my home assembly and in honor of my former pastor. But now his custom was to teach the principles at least once a year. And that has been my custom to teach the principles at least once a year. Now, what happens is, normally we experience uh, great growth in our church. If you all notice over the years, it's always around the months of December and January. That's because the first part of the year, the saints are getting understanding and getting foundational teaching to be effective in their witness. Amen. I remember one year, I think it was not too long ago, but one year, um, I started out teaching the principles. Then I went from the principles to the oneness of God in Christ Jesus, from the oneness of God in Christ Jesus to church government. And that year, if the record served me correctly, by December and January, over 60 people were baptized in water in Jesus' name, and 20-some of those received the gift of the Holy Ghost. Now, I'm just saying that perhaps there are some, some young pastors who are watching tonight. Um, church growth is based upon the growth of your sheep, your people, their sheep. Remember, the Lord told me to feed my sheep, and he said, feed my lambs. The lamb's the difference in the lamb and the sheep. The lamb is the offspring of the sheep. And in order for a church to grow, sheep beget sheep. Amen? And so when you have a church of mature saints, they then in turn are able to bring forth fruit which is new saints or babes. That's how it works. In the natural, as a metaphor, there are certain times of the year when a shepherd wants his herd to grow, his sheep's herd to grow. And what he does is he increases in more of an enriched diet. Through the enriched diet, Something happens to the sheep hormonally, um, and it causes them to, to come together and mate um, because of the hormonal changes in the sheep based upon the enriched diet. So in the spiritual, that's just natural figurative speaking, there are certain areas of the church. Not only do you have to give the principles, there are other subjects that are more enriched, deeper subjects. And when these subjects are taught, after you've finished with the principles and the oneness and church government, and you get into subjects that are much en enriched, um, Subjects like um, the seven feasts of Jehovah as it relates to the seven days of creation. That's an enriched and in-depth subject in the scriptures. But mature saints, um, it does something in them spiritually when they receive in-depth revelation. It causes them then to move into areas of teaching and witnessing and that's how your church is supposed to grow by way of the mature saints witnessing and winning others to Christ. And I may not have given it all to you like it should be laid out because I gave it to you in a nutshell, but, but that's how it has worked 
for me, and that's how it worked for my former pastor, uh, Bishop Rader Johnson, my brother in the gospel. We followed the same principle. Um, our, our, our presiding bishop, Bishop um, Charles Johnson, a great church, great morning star, same principle of enriched teaching. Um, bishop C.O. Hardy, same principle. All that um, use these principles in enriched teaching, their churches are solidified. Um, and the name, go, I can go down the list. I mean, even the pastors in our council, um, uh, Bishop Andre Hunter, for example, follows this. It's, it goes on and on. It's an apostolic principle. It's not just to Bishop Combs or myself. I'm just telling you, that's how I got it. But it's an apostolic principle in all of our apostolic churches that follow teaching and enrich diets when it comes to teaching the word of God. Their churches solidify, they grow, they stabilize, and it's, and, it's, and it's across the board. So it's not just limited, you know, sometimes I mention, I mention my pastor a lot because I love my pastor, and I, and I appreciate him more than you all would ever know, but it's, it's, it's a principle that is across the board. Amen? So I don't want, to, I don't want it to seem like, you know, I'm something special. I just got it from the fathers, and I'm just following the pattern of the fathers. And I'm saying to you young pastors, if you follow the same pattern, it does work. Amen. Except the Lord build a house, Amen. then labor in vain that build it. Upon this rock, Jesus said, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. He's the master builder. Um, the apostle Paul said, I've laid the foundation, another build it thereupon, but let every man take heed how he buildeth. For the foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ Jesus. So I don't want it to, I don't want anyone to think that I'm trying to be special. I'm just following the pattern. Amen. <laughs> Amen. God bless you tonight. And if you follow the pattern, you'll be successful too. Amen. All right. Um, um, on tonight. Um, and again, if you're desiring salvation, because in the beginning, I asked you the question, unto what then were you baptized? So think about it. Let me know, because we're here to assess, assist you and to do all we can to help you to be ready when the Lord comes for his church. And if he's calling you, he wants you to be in his church, and he wants you to be ready. And that is a blessing. That is a blessing. Amen. So on tonight, uh, let's receive our tithe and offerings um, um, on this evening. And of course, if um, I think the information on screen, you can mail in your contributions if you are at a distance. Um, we thank the Lord for our precious sister there in Illinois. Sister Clark, we ain't forgot you. We ain't forgot you. We're still praying for you and your family. Amen. Amen. And, and, and so, um, um, as you prepare your giving, uh, the information is on the screen for Cash App. And, of course, we do have a Tithe app if you're not comfortable with Cash App. Uh, you can go to our website and go to our, the Tithe app and give on tonight. I want you to know the Lord has smiled on us. He's been good to us. I'm going to tell you, all uh, right, how many of the Lord has blessed in the last, you know, we was in prayer, to, we was in prayer, was it last month, Elder Fleming? Last month, and, and the Lord laid it on my heart to let you all know that um, he was going to bless some of you all with increase. Anybody got increase? Amen. All right, all right. Increase. Increase. He's, he is so wonderful, so good. And he ain't through blessing you. He, he just waiting on you. He ain't through blessing you. And, and, and um, um, I was on the phone with one of our brothers Sunday. He was telling me how much he enjoyed the, the message and some of the things he was going through. And while he was talking to me on the phone, he said, hold on, Pastor, let me take this call. 
and he got off, had, had me to hold the call, got off the call, and he said, Pastor, you're not going to believe this. I said, what's that? He said, I've been offered a, um, a position, and, and I can't tell you how much it is a month, but it would blow your mind because it's just, it's just a few hours out of the month, and it expands his business. Um, I couldn't believe it. I said, are you serious? I said, we were just talking. He said, while we was talking. And see, this is what we have to understand, saints. See, they spake of him often, and the Lord heard it and wrote it in the book of remembrance. You need somebody that you can just talk to sometime about the goodness of the Lord. Amen? If you notice me, uh, you're always going to hear me say something like, the Lord is good, isn't he? The Lord has smiled on you. Amen? I go through my auntie's house, I walk through there, I'd be telling her, I say, the Lord be good to you. <laughs> she know it. She know it. The Lord been good to her. She get rid of some of them devilish rugs, but the Lord been good to you. <laughs> them rugs scare me, but the Lord been good to you. Amen. Amen. And, and I, I'm tempted to go down that slide. But I don't want the slide to break on my way to the water. I don't want it to break and I fall through the slide. So, but be that as it may, God has been good to us. Amen. Lord bless you tonight. Have a smile upon you.